I'm going to start. Um, uh, welcome everyone to the regular meeting of council on Monday, April 2nd. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Are there any late items to add to the agenda? The, there, there is a little bit of a, a change in order, and that is that we will do the property tax uh, rate presentation. Uh, there will be some uh, need for decision making, uh, Council, but what I would like to do is defer our discussion and questions on that presentation until after we have public input. And in that way, we can consider uh, the input that we receive as well. So with that change in order, I would uh, ask for your approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? None opposed. Motion is carried. We have the minutes of the spe uh, special meeting of council March 6th and 7th. Uh, Move adoption. Thank you. A seconder? Second. All those, are, are there any errors, omissions, or changes required? Being none, all those in favor? None opposed. Motion is carried. Uh, we have the minutes uh, of the special meeting of council March 19th and the regular meeting of council March 19th. Uh, we need a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Thank you. And are there any errors, omissions, or changes? Councilor Hummel. Um, thank you. So I would just uh, ask for clarification then on page 17. Uh, so this is the regular meeting of Council March the 19th. And it's to do with um, item 10-3. Uh, and it was about that staff insurance through negotiations with Victoria Animal Control Services. There was a viable enforcement throughout the week with variable hours. And my understanding was that we also wanted to include weekends. And that wasn't abundantly clear. And I, I think that it would be helpful if we said throughout the week, including weekends with variable hours. Thank you. Councilor Brink. Uh, on page 13, though I appreciate the, uh, the bump in uh, status, I don't get the pay grade, so um, the mayor, mm -hmm. Megan Brink, needs to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Take the pay, it's quite a bump in too. That's a bump in pay, but I don't actually get it. <laughs> okay. Any other changes? Seeing none, with those amendments, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. We have the minutes of the special meeting on council March 26th. I need a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Unopposed motion is carried. Thank you. We now move on to the 2012 property tax rate presentation, and this will be by Ms. Hurst. And I believe for the public, there are yes, yes, there are handouts. Great. values that we get from BC assessment but we also have what we call is called what's called a multiple and multiple defines the relationship between the property classes now this sheet you can see the province um, legislates multiples that the regional district has to use in calculating their tax rates and those are in the at the top of the page in the second column um, municipalities have the right to vary vary their multiples um, and it used to be until I think it's 10 or 15 years ago, uh, we had to follow the provincial multiples as well, but we do not have to do that any longer. So we have two variables that we work with. Our tax rates change and also our, our multiples change. Everything, um, all property classes are based off of the residential property class. Residential property class is a multiple of one. And, and 
And so the multiple of all the other classes is from, in relationship to residential. So for instance, here in 2011, our utility tax rate was 4.93164 times the residential rate. So that's how your, how your uh, property classes uh, um, relate to each other. Everything's a multiple of the residential tax rate. Um, so it adds a little bit to the complication uh, when you are um, trying to figure out your tax rates. But it also allows you, uh, under your um, guidelines and principles and objectives that you adopted a couple of years ago that are in your financial plan bylaw, it allows us to um, take into account changes in assessed values. For instance, if uh, your residential assessments go up on average uh, 5%, you can, uh, you can uh, calculate your tax rate to uh, take that into account. And that, you'll see that later as we go through the details. Uh, but this is just uh, one of the restrictions that we do have. So we have no restrictions on our multiples other than for one property class, and that is um, for our utilities. And our utilities are class two properties. The tax rate cannot exceed $40 for every $1,000 of assessed value or two and a half times the rate of class six. So your tax rate for utilities cannot exceed that ratio. There are no other restrictions on your multiples or on your tax rates. So, and this, um, these uh, rules and guidelines will become clear as we go through the details, or I hope they will anyway, if I've done my job properly. Um, so, where we start is, we just recently got um, what's called the revised assessment rule, which is uh, after all, um, appeals have been taken into account, and that's what we use to actually calculate our tax rates. So we're at our, we received our revised role uh, last week or the week before, and um, this is where everything fell out. So you can see on the top uh, section our 2011 final assessments. Now our 2012 revised, which is the final version that we just got, and then it shows the increase or decrease in each of the property classes, and then we've translated it to a percentage. Now when we uh, had at our last meeting at a discussion where we talked about we were, we were at about a 2.49% tax increase. And we were doing that fairly roughly because we, only, we didn't have our final version of the assessment roll then. And um, now we do. Now once we, I, I started putting these numbers together, you can see that at first glance, um, we've got overall one property class major industry that went up 15.88% in their assessments, which is quite a large height. Then the, um, you go from that increase and decrease overall. It's then divided into non-market change and existing assessment changes. So non-market change is um, anything to do not with the market. So change in inventory, additions, deletions, new buildings, dem demolitions of old buildings, that's that category. Existing assessment increase or decrease is every, all the, all the um, housing stock and uh, land that existed last year, that's the change that they experienced in their assessments overall. So here, when I when first party started putting these numbers together, you can see under light industry, there was a huge change, 34% decrease under non-market change, and then a 32% increase in existing assessment, which is, um, I guess it, it just stood out as a red flag for me. So once we, I started looking into it, um, what I discovered is, is there was a $4.1 million property that actually had been reclassified from uh, light industry into commercial, and that's the oil tank farm, because it's being decommissioned, so it changed property classes, which is, is not unusual um, in itself, but what it does is it kind of skews these numbers when we're trying to take into account the percentage when we're doing tax rates. So, um, so what I did uh, was I took the um, reclassification, and reclassified it um, for the percentages into the right categories, which makes your increase and your decrease much less skewed. Um, so 
that uh, light industry property. We didn't see, if you go back to the beginning, bottom of the page, right hand side, 32.8%. We didn't have an increase in assessed value for existing properties of $4.7 million. What it was was a whole property that got reclassified. So in order to uh, get rid of that skewing, we actually put that assessed value in the proper uh, class that it was supposed to be in. So starting from there, that change, that changes our numbers a bit, changes our tax increase a bit, um, and not for the bad, but for the good. So once we did that, and I apologize for how small these numbers are, getting it all on one page, so hopefully everybody has handouts where you can look at it on, on your screens. So here's where the, the, the um, calculations happen. So the top section of, of the page is basically a very simple um, calculation, 2011. And I think here's where I want to make a distinction. When we talk about an increase of 2.49%, we're not talking about changing our tax rate by 2.49%. What we're talking about is we want 2.49% more tax revenue than we collected last year. That doesn't translate to an increase in the tax rate of that much. Um, this is where this whole um, taking into account the assessments comes in. So the first part of the calculation when we're filling when we're doing our tax rates is we take 2011 revenue that we got from each of the property classes. We say we want 2.49% more revenue than we got last year, so simple math. We come up with a total amount of uh, tax revenue that, that's going, that we need to collect. Then we go down to the second row, and I take those dollar values that I need at 2.49, and I say what does my multiple and my tax rate have to be to collect that much revenue in each of those property classes? Now what happens there is your multiple changes because what we're doing is we're saying um, our existing assessment, you see on the far right hand side of the page, your existing assessment, for example residential, went down by 2.19%. So in, in order to collect 2.49% more revenue, I actually have to change the tax rate by 4.78%. Um, so on average, if you had a, a, the average residential property in a square mile, you would be paying 2.49% more than you paid last year. And that works out for every single category. So I go through and I do each of those calculations for the property class. And that's just on the existing assessment because you want your existing assess or existing properties to change by 2.49%. You figure out those tax rates and those multiples and then you apply it to your non-market change. So you basically get two sets of revenue. You take your existing assessments, you have them pay two point, I'm gonna be tired of saying 2.49, so 2.5% more than 2011, and then you say now all the uh, new properties have to pay at the same tax rate. And then, so you come up with on the bottom of the page, total tax revenue of $14.3 million. And that's broken down into 2.49% from existing assessments and 1.743 from new construction or non-market changes. Now, there's an additional complication to that because then I have to take all of these new tax rates and multiples and apply them to the federal payment, uh, federal properties where we get pay payment in lieu of taxes to see if we are overall in collecting enough money to balance our budget. Um, so I've done all these calculations. You can see very far right hand side of the page, middle of the page, that's my basically my proof that everything is calculated properly because every property class is paying 2.49% more than we paid last year. So I take these multiples and these tax rates and I apply them to the federal properties. And I see how much money I'm then collecting from federal properties. I add municipal tax revenue to the PILT revenue, and I collect a total of 23.4 million. Well, I only need 23.2 million to balance the budget. So at 2.49%, we'd actually be over or collecting $146,000 more than what I need to balance the budget. Now added to that, we know, um, or, or we're going down the road that um, Victoria has reduced
reduced their payments to policing. In previous years, when we have done that, they when we have said we're going to reduce our payment for policing by $100,000. Victoria has reduced their payment proportionately. So if we do that for SWIMAC based on what Victoria is reducing theirs, it doesn't translate to much, but it's t around $27,000. So, um, and we have not reduced the budget requirement by that $27,000. So really, in reality, I'm actually collecting $146,000 more than I need, plus another $27,000 at 2.49%. So having done all these calculations and got to the end and found out that I'm collecting more money than I need to balance the budget, I think, well, what other scenarios could we look at? Um, and before I get there, I'll just show you what this translates to. So, so I took those tax rates, now I say, well, how much does that actually impact the average residential property? How much more are they gonna be paying at 2.49%? And so on this sheet, I've, take, uh, I've taken the 2012 and 2011 numbers and the rates and said, okay, at 2.49%, the average residential property in a square mall in 2012 would pay 56 more dollars than 2011. And that works the same for each of those property classes. So recreation would pay $21 more. Major industry would pay 1,000. Uh, business, 239. Just follow all of those down, and that's at the 2.49%. Of course, we can only do this on average because we're dealing with five, you know, 3,500 or 4,500 properties. So if someone's assessment increases or decreases more than the average, it's going to vary a little bit. But this is so this is just on average how much people would pay. So that's at 2.49. So having seen that. I, I've got more money than I need to balance the budget. What are some additional scenarios you could look at? So that, um, so I started on another scenario. And I thought, okay, what did we do in the budget that we maybe want to reconsider? Because we have about $173,000 to work with. And I thought, okay, we reduced our, our um, our contribution to our capital project reserve fund, which is something we don't normally do because we want to keep contributing money to that for future capital projects. We also reduced our contingency, and there was some discussion around that at the last meeting. We reduced that by $50,000. So what if we went back to the budget and said, okay, we don't have to reduce those two payments. We can leave those in the budget. And I can still reduce, going through all the calculations, I can still reduce the tax rate from 2.49 to 2. Or the tax revenue to 2.21 and put those two things back in the budget so that we're not reducing our contingency and we're still contributing to our capital projects reserve fund at the balance that we have for the last uh, number of years. So that was one scenario. So you do all those calculations again um, and so I get to this page where I apply it to the Pelt properties and you'll see at the bottom of the page I've got um, a deficit or I've got a surplus of 82,000. I balanced to that. I worked with the tax rates and the multiples to balance that because that number is the 110,000 that we would put back for budget plus the 27,000 reduction for policing costs. So I actually need this $82,000 in surplus to, to make that scenario work. So at, at 2.21, you could, you could bump your contingency back up and your contribution to your capital projects reserve fund. That's an option you might want to think about. Um, Lori, just before you go on, Councillor Hunterly had a question, but my, I would really prefer if you, if we can see all the scenarios, unless it was something prior to the scenario. Um, it, it was actually prior, and it was to deal with Pelt. And I was trying to figure out, based on other information that we've been given in the package, um, about where that lands. And so if the federal government elects not to give us the amount that we expect, then we would have to make it up. So I'm concerned about where we make it up and so whether this was based on monies that we don't don't know that we have. I, I don't expect that we would have to make it up and, and I'll explain that. Because um, and first of all let me let me say that again these these are this is a preliminary tax rate presentation because while we have the revised assessment role for our municipal properties, we do not yet have the final grant roll for the federal properties. We have not received that yet. So we're going on very conservative numbers for our culture right now. Um, and we 
haven't had to make that up in previous years, and here's why. Because we take on the effort of ensuring that we budget conservatively. We may send our, um, we fill out our forms and we send them into D&D saying these are, these are our tax rates and these are the BC assessment values. We know that they don't agree with them. But it, and here's what we expect to get paid. That's not what we budget. We budget for what Public Works and Government Services Canada says they're going to agree to pay on. And then if we happen to get that extra, that money that we're, we think we should be getting because they should be paying on the BC assessment values, then we'll have to roll that back into the budget. But we budget conservatively. Thank you. Um, so just, um, so at 2.21, where you want those two um, budget items back up, this is what it looks like for the average property in each of those property classes. So at 2.21, now a residential property, instead of paying five fifty-six dollars more this in 2012, they pay fifty dollars more. So all of these numbers have gone down slightly because we've reduced the tax revenue that we're collecting. So that was the second scenario, and then I thought, okay, well let's throw one more scenario in here. <laughs> so then. Um, Here's the next scenario. This is, you don't change anything in the budget. You leave it exactly the way it is. You just reduce the tax rate and only collect how much money you need for the budget that you've already looked at. That gets us down to 1.73%. And at 1.73%, and I know all the numbers work because the proofs have, have worked out, we, call, we um, are short, technically, we're, we haven't funded $27,000 in the budget. But that's the reduction that we would we would take from the policing costs. So this actually does balance. So at 1.73%, your tax rate is exactly what you need to balance the budget um, after it's been applied to the, the federal properties as well. And here's what that looks like for the average property in each of those classes. Your net here, residential properties now pay $39 more than last year as opposed to 50 or $56. Um, a business pays $166 more than last year. So, um, and that's not to say that these are the only three scenarios that you could have. You could have, um, but these are the three that just jumped to my mind right from the beginning um, of, of things that came out from the previous discussions. The other thing I wanted to throw into um, the first option is uh, Council's made a recommendation about policing. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. We have, don't have a final answer from this all jam. But so under scenario one, you you could um, leave it at 2.49. You could take that $173,000 and put it into reserve fund for for potential leasing transition costs. Should that decision happen and you need those funds, it was it was just something I wanted to put out there. Scenario number two. As I said, 2.21%, and you put your capital project reserve fund uh, contribution and your contingency back up to their previous levels because we cut those down during during the budget to get it to 2.49. Or scenario three, you leave everything as it is. You deal with any uh, transition costs that you may or may not have, or that you may have when they come up, and you reduce your tax rate to 1.73%. Um, and then I just had a final page. I know the numbers are small, but I thought maybe you might want to just compare what each property, average property would pay in each of those property classes as under the three scenarios while you're deliberating more so that the audience can see them. And I'm sorry if I went through this too fast, but I, it looked like everybody was coming along. So, Thank you. Yeah. I, I think we'll come back to our questions. Uh, and uh, at this time, uh, Council, you basically uh, we need to make a decision about the option or the direction we want to give council or uh, staff uh, by the end of the night. Uh, so at this point, we'll move on to public input. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak? Come forward, Vicki. This kind of just occurred to me, so it's not been planned, okay? Um, and we haven't really gotten to the policing part. Is it okay to talk about the policing thing? Vicki, if you can give us your name and where you live and 
Uh, Vicky and speak to any part of this uh, within the budget. Vicky Vukmarovic, I live at number 3703 Pine Street, right on the border of Victoria and Esquimalt. And um, I see that policing of budget was on the table. Now, in the newspaper, they were talking about how we're getting all these uh, motorcycles from the states. Before that, we were getting them from action motorcycles here. When I went to the special budget meeting in Victoria, um, there was this mention about asking for a cutback on the budget for the police. And it seems to me if we're getting uh, motorcycles from America, it's going to cost more than if we were doing it locally. And we're all trying to invest in buying locally. And so I kind of wonder who's paying attention to what. Uh, that's not my forte. My forte is usually around people and behavior. And uh, that's difficult enough to manage. But there's much uh, smarter people that know about the numbers. And uh, it seems to be quite a contention about expenditure regarding police budget and the quality of uh, services versus more expenditure into um, kind of stuff like fancy motor cycles from America. It doesn't exactly fit for me. I like to see the money go where it's needed the most. And I would like people to put whatever issues are going on regarding the intention between Esquimalt and Victoria into coming to the table and uh, making something happen that's going to work for the public, both in Esquimalt and Victoria. And uh, that's about the best I can do right now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members of the public that wish to speak? Are there other members of the public that wish to speak? Third time. Any members of the public that wish to speak? Seeing none, we'll come back now to our uh, 2012 property tax rates discussion. And I will open it up for questions at this time. Councillor Hundleby. Thank you. So just to clarify then, uh, scenario one refers to establishing a reserve fund for potential policing transition costs. And that does not include replacement of the reserve fund and contingency. Is that correct That's for you to Ms. Harrison? That's correct. So I, thank you. I, I think my problem now is looking at this and thinking, well, this is really great considering I heard that inflation is 2.8%. So we, all of these scenarios certainly meet that. Um, what concern I had was around ensuring that we maintain our infrastructure. We know that some municipalities are having a lot of difficulty with maintaining their infrastructure because they have not replaced and put money aside in their reserve funds. So then my question is, uh, I guess, uh, through the mayor to staff, uh, Ms. Hurst, is when do we then replace the money that we have been using and will be using? When do we replace that? And should we not consider that um, I'm not sure if I quite understand. We contribute to the Capital Project Reserve Fund, the Machine Unit Equipment Depreciation Reserve Fund to replace our vehicles and to fund capital projects. We contribute to that at a level of $1 million every year. To the Capital Project Reserve Fund, a $1 million. We fund our Machine Unit Equipment Depreciation um, every year as well. We put a certain amount in for the fire department, we put a certain amount in for public works, and a certain amount for Parks and Rec. So we do contribute. What we did as part of the budget to get to the 2.49%, we said for this year and for this year only, because we had some additional expenditures this year, um, we have our centennial year, that's an additional expenditure for us. We said for this one year, instead of contributing a million dollars to our capital projects reserve fund, we're going to con contribute one or, or $940,000 and reduce it by 60. We also said that we normally have a $250,000 contingency in our budget for any items that come up through the year that council hasn't budgeted for that you have that money to utilize. Um, and we said instead of a $250,000 contingency, we'll only have a $200,000 contingency this year. So those are the two things that, so it's not that we're not funding and not putting money away for, for infrastructure, it's that we just one time only reduced it for this year. And I guess
this is what surprised me then about scenario one, is that we talk about potential policing transition costs, but we have no idea what those might be. We, we have no idea if we will have those. That's right. We don't even know if we need it. No. Councilor Morrison and Councilor Green. Um, sorry, this wasn't my question, but it just, just occurred to me now. So, uh, going back to scenario one, um, with that hundred seventy-three thousand dollars that we were to go with scenario one, and we don't need it, right? It just goes back into the general contingency. Is that right? No, you would. Um, we could, the, we could roll it in to reduce tax rates for the for the following year. Council would, would make that decision because reserve fund. Um, we can't take money out of it without a council resolution. So it would come back to council with some scenarios or some options for how you would deal with that, and you would make that decision. Somewhat of a rainy day fund that yes. we could use for whatever purpose. But you can change the purpose of it. As long as council democratically does that. Okay. Um, so my other question was, when we look at the average dollar amount uh, increases, that takes into account, obviously, that people sometimes forget this, that if their property value change was below the average, then they actually will be looking at a decrease in their tax yes. from last year. Or, or paying lower than the $56 to pay. Right. Yes. So it, it could be a situation where a certain segment of our, our property owners do receive a, a, a negative in terms of uh, comparison to last year. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I look at these options and, I, and then I look at the context of, of these options where we're at, um, both with our economic situation generally um, as, a, as a globe. Um, and I look at the cost of living uh, and the inflation rates. Um, I think, are, as Councillor Hundleby's inflation was 2.8, cost of living was somewhere around there as well. And the fact that our most recent census told us that our population is down, um, I just, I'm, I, this is the work of miracles. I really, I'm, I'm very impressed with this. And we have three scenarios. They're all significantly low uh, tax uh, increases. Um, and almost, I think, unprecedented, at least in recent memory. So, uh, as I say, I'm very impressed. And I think because we're looking at such small differences, I tend to, uh, when I have, you know, if there's a a vast wide scope of you know five percent or one percent, then I think we'd have a big debate on our hands. But but when these numbers are so close together and, and the dollar amounts, as you said, uh, outlined for the different property classes are, are quite close together as well, I tend to side on the air of caution in that sort of scenario and, and I look at things very conservatively. I'm one of those people that needs to be able to sleep at night knowing that there is a uh, comfortable contingency fund in place. There is um, a comfortable amount of extra funds available if they so needed to be used, and, and hopefully they won't. Um, so I'm, I, as much as tempting as scenario three is, I, I tend to shy away from that. And, and somewhere, in the, I definitely like scenario two, and that does allow us to get back to our capital project reserve and more significantly uh, um, uh, maintain our contingency at the previous level. Uh, 2.49, it's, it's kind of like we're setting up this $173,000 for no, for no specific purpose other than what we think might possibly be used for policing, but perhaps something else as we just discussed. So, so that's kind of got a bit of a question mark on it. I, I hate to give people tax increase for no apparent logical purpose. So, so I, I, I come back to scenario two, but I'm, I'm blown away by these numbers. I'm very impressed. So this is, this, and this is also in the context of not having full finance uh, contingents of staff and whatnot. So this is, this is quite significant. And also when you compare us to other municipalities in the region, but also across the province, uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet that we're going to come in as one of the lowest uh, uh, you know, um, communities in our con in our, that are similar to us. And I think that is just Significant achievement that proves that this council has the ability of do this, doing this uh, year after year. So, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Morrison. Just before I go to Councillor Breen, um, there is one uh, other um, 
option that we may want to consider, and I spoke with Ms. Hurst about this earlier, that I'd be asking this question to bring it to your attention. And that is, is that when we have such a reduced tax revenue increase, such as we have the potential to go down to 1.73, we have the potential to um, respond to uh, our business community uh, in terms of changing the multiple. And when the rates are higher, the impact to residents is, are, are certainly much higher. And when you change the multiples, um, that, that's even more significant. But with this low rate, we have the opportunity to look at and address that need uh, by a small amount which will not significantly increase or change the amount to residents. Uh, and so um, the, the other thing is, in looking at that, would a change in multiples uh, on the business perspective help us with our economic development? Does it help to answer our strategic plan? Um, so I, I want to put that out there, and Ms. Hurst, do, do you, can you just sort of um, answer to, or, or give us a comment on, on that change? Um, I could do all of the above. Um, so, I mean, economic development, I think the fact that our, your, your, the highest tax revenue increase you're looking at is 2.49 uh, 2, 2 is going to do something for economic development, regardless of, of, of moving forward. Um, I think what, what you're referring to, though, is, is um, reducing the increase over last year for the business property class even more significantly than it is here. Um, I guess the only comments I have on that are that regardless of how you change the multiples, you need as much money as you need. Like, we need the $23 million. If you change the multiple on the business class, Yes, you can collect less per property in the business class, but all the other classes are going to have to make up for that because the money has to come from one or all of them. The other thing, and I, um, um, I didn't talk about this earlier, though, is um, that the um, financial plan objectives and policies that we brought forward a couple of year, years or a couple of weeks ago um, talked about. Um, this strategy about how we deal, how we calculate the tax rate. So you would have to make a conscious decision to not follow those policies and objectives, because those policies and objectives speak to calculating your tax rates by taking into account the assessment values. And But it also wouldn't be, having said that, it wouldn't be setting a precedent. We have done that in previous years. So does that address all of Yes, uh, uh, it, it certainly helps. Uh, I guess, uh, again, Council, I just want to say that over the years, we consistently are told by our business community, you have the highest taxes in the region. It's difficult to set up a business here. I, when I compare to other communities, you you are high. How can, and, and with a low rate like we have, which I need to stress that every other municipality is saying, our rate is such and such, and then our infrastructure costs are this amount. This includes our infrastructure, so we are significantly uh, in a good place. Right. Is it the time, given this low rate, that we can make that slight adjustment to show our business community a change that doesn't significantly impact those other classes um, and, and gives that, that goodwill to the business community. I'll put the question out. Uh, so, Councillor Brink, you're next. Um, you must have been reading my mind because that was pretty much my question after sitting in with the Chamber of Commerce as the liaison for the last three, four years now. It is something that I have consistently heard from the business community. So, um, that was something that I wanted to, to definitely take a look at. Um, and I'm sure we can have some more discussions on that. The other part is we, the only reason we can get to this point where we are, that we can even look at a 1.73 and not put into our contingency fund as much as we have, is because for the last many years, 
we have done that. And this is why Esquimalt is probably coming out the best in the region, except for maybe, you know, Langford with all of their, their generations coming in of money. But we have for years been fiscally responsible and this is where we're starting to see the reward for it, which is really nice. And, and that can be attributed to mostly staff and their foresight, their foresight for sure. Um, but I would like to look at, as the mayor said, something that can be done. I, you look at, uh, even at the 2.21, an increase of $956 for municipal, or for, sorry, major industry, and 412 for light industry, and 212 for business. Those are still considerable increases. Um, I really don't even like to look at the 2.49, because that's, that's a lot. I mean, that's, uh, for some of our businesses, it can be make or break. So. It is, uh, it is something to definitely consider if that is indeed the direction we as council want to make, which is economic development, we are the highest taxes in the region for, for business. So we do need to look at it. Ms. Hurst, um, I, I just wanted to add um, that I, we, I, we, um, I can certainly rework these numbers based on that direction, but again, you have to realize that anything you shift off of that property class is going to have to be paid by your residents, by um, recreation by everybody else. And you, what you also have to realize is because of those multiples, that when you shift um, dollars from light industry, major industry, or business who have a much higher tax rate, a much higher multiple, it, it's that, it, it, it impacts your residential more because you collect least of, or the lowest tax rate is in your residential. But I also have to say too, if, if you want to give that direction, you are going to have to change your, your, your budget and tax schedule because I, we, as much as I went through this presentation in 15 minutes, it takes about four days for me to come up with these scenarios and to recalculate these and to, and, and to do all of that. I can't meet this budget schedule. Or we're supposed to bring back the next meeting the first, second, and third reading of the bylaw. I can't do that if we have to have another meeting. We would have to have another meeting to go over more scenarios. So not that that should stop me from making that decision, but I think you need to make that decision knowing that we'd have to have some special meetings to do that. Thank you. Sorry, one, and one more item. So you talked about um, the increase to light industry and, and not, not that this would be significant, but we don't have any municipal properties that are light industry. Okay, and, and just as a follow-up, that's actually really good to know. All, all of our light industry is municipal. There's none in D and D. Major industry, there's t only 12 properties, and there are five of them are in D and D, and the rest are. Okay, and then just because you bring up a valid point, I mean, that, in no way do I want to download it all to the yeah. residents, and, and that's exactly what we'd be doing. But even just using like I don't know, ten dollars. Can you just give me a rough idea? No, it's way harder than that. I make. I just make it look simple. You do. <laughs> you do actually. That's my job. Uh, Councillor Shinbine. Thank you, Your uh, <coughs> My question was based on the, was looking at the, the tax rate multipliers, and I know that we talked at a previous council meeting of possible business incentives, uh, you know, to, to promote development. We were talking about that. Are those type of incentives then, are they reflected in the multiplier? For example, we decide we're going to give X business this break to do whatever. Uh, then does that reduce the multiple multiplier or is that how does that work then? No, the multiplier is simply to do with assessed values and property tax rates. When we talk about incentives for economic development, we talk about some things that we're allowed to do under the community charter, which is to designate a revitalization center where you, or revitalization area, and you actually define the boundaries of it. And then you can give um, incentives, breaks towards tax rates once you've established that area. You can't do it on an individual basis with businesses. You're actually prohibited from giving tax breaks to individual businesses. But if you establish an area that you say, this is our revitalization area, and here's the plan that we have, if 
someone builds a new building here, for the first year, they don't pay any property taxes. For the second year, they pay 20% of what they would have. And then third year, they pay 50%. Those are the types of things we're talking about. That would be what would come back in, um, and you recall a couple of meetings ago, we talked about developing an, an overall master plan. That would be part of that. That doesn't come into this at all. Um, having said that, um, and I recognize that council wants to get moving forward with doing something for the businesses, I'm hesitant to do that on an ad hoc basis before we've done the master plan because that would be part of the master plan. If we need to change those policies and objectives that we have in the financial plan, we need to know what the overall impact that's going to be on our tax revenue, and we need to have a long-term plan for that. And we would do that as part of the master plan. We would do incentives, but we would also do, here's what we think we should do with tax rates going forward in, every, in order to give businesses those breaks, but we need to know what that's going to cost us in lost revenue, and we need to be able to plan for that, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, that, thank you very much, that's, that was specifically what I was asking. But just for clarification uh, mm -hmm. for myself, yes. if we go to any type of business development centers, um, that, as long as I understand this clearly, we're making decisions later, that still doesn't fundamentally cha change the business multiplier, correct? No. This is, those would be separate, and then at that point, we would have to debate, okay, if we go with this incentive, will we give up this much money? Exactly. We're going to have to pick it up, but it, it would not affect exactly. the rates at all. Wouldn't affect the rates, it would affect the overall revenue that you're collecting, and you would have to plan for that. Thank you. Councillor Hutchins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and kudos to Ms. Hurst and all the staff. I mean, uh, they've done a great job of uh, packaging the financial information and presenting us some very workable solutions and options. And certainly, I mean, we have heard loud and clear from the residents and business owners the need for us, especially this year, given the economic challenges globally and certainly within our region, need to be physically responsible, so it's, it's, it's good news all around. I like the conversation around looking for opportunities to support our existing businesses and also opportunities to ensure there are some dollars available for the economic development that we, we do need. I mean, that's, that's certainly something that all of us, I believe, support. I'm not sure that uh, in short, on short notice and in this short period of time, I'm not sure I would want to take that on. I would prefer that we look at this as an opportunity in the year ahead and make a commitment to our residents and specifically business that we will find a way to address that need, knowing that uh, there's, I'll say, some, a lot of flexibility, but we have a little bit of flexibility financially. And if we're considering some funding towards new businesses, let's look to reward existing businesses at the same time with uh, the overall notion of being uh, physically responsible. So that, that I prefer to do it going forward as opposed to try and do it immediately. And I'm not sure that we get it right and that would be certain. Uh, my response to that having sat at this table is that we we continually do that mm. and that our um, we're in a in a very unique situation this year, to be at the level that we're at. And if um, in other years we haven't had that opportunity, uh, if we don't uh, potentially look at that opportunity this year, my worry is something will come up and we'll have missed that. Uh, I know that the businesses have heard it before. They hear it every year. and. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I guess what, what I would like to um, suggest to Council, and, and we'll continue this discussion, but 
the, the, we ask staff, and in recognition that this changes the schedule and that we will have to be flexible in terms of extra meetings or a different, a different, a, an extra meeting to provide us with this information, to, to, to get a scenario whereby we did a nominal change to the business uh, multiplier, say, of 0.2%, uh, something like that. Uh, and I don't know whether staff can give us uh, more of a, an idea what that nominal amount could be that would make some sort of impact. But um, without really seeing the numbers, we don't have a sense. And as I say, uh, having sat at this table now um, for uh, this, this going on seven years, I guess, um, the opportunity has never presented itself before with projects that are coming up such as things like sewage treatment, like uh, light rapid transit that the region is looking at, that uh, we're also looking at in potential with uh, the changes with policing. This opportunity may not come ag around again for a long, long time. And uh, uh, I would hate to miss it if, it if it is viable. And I don't know if it is at this time. Councilor Brink. Um, just a question through to staff. Um, Ms. Hurst, on, I guess, the, the tax rate multiple slide, which is, I guess, slide two, um, you show the provincial multiples, and I have to admit, I've never really paid attention to those. Maybe it's, well, though, it's just that every year you get thrown with numbers, and every year you pick up a new thing, right? So, looking at the provincial multiples, how many, and you may not know this, but how many municipalities are at those multiples or higher, or are many of them below those multiples? I don't, uh, I would. Like I see that we're, we're relative. I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Because I see that for major and light, major industry, we're a lot higher, business a bit higher, and say for Yeah, well, most of ours are, are pretty much in line, and yeah. some of them are a little higher. Um, I can only speak from my own experience. Uh, most municipalities are, no, I, sh I shouldn't even make it. I have no idea. I, I don't want to put anybody in a bad position by speaking without the nature of the answer, so I don't know. Okay. Um, I have Councillor Hundle. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I've uh, heard the discussion and I think it's quite interesting. I also agree that we are in a very unique situation this year. Um, and the, the past councils have had to bite the bullet in and pass on higher ones. And so, you know, I also thought about business and wondered whether or not we could, what we might be able to do with, uh, for them. The fact that we've come in with, I mean, 2.2 is just amazing. And if we can give them, you know, the benefit of um, a less increase than, than other places might give, I think that's a pretty good bonus with the promise, and I, I'm really committed to going through with this master plan and, and having a good idea about what it is and how we do it, but certainly I think that we need to have some sort of incentives for business, um, And but I'd like to see us do it in a very holistic way as opposed to doing it a bit here and a bit there. Uh, but I certainly understand the motivation for trying to do something now. But if we went to scenario two, which is where I tend to be leaning, um, I think that's not a bad thing. So um, that's all I have to say for now. But sure, I'll have some more to say later. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor, is there any appetite to having staff um, take a look at, at a change in business um, multiplier. Council. Just, just, a, just a quick comment. Because of, I hear, you know, everybody has the, I think, the appetite for it, but it's timing, it's do we rush it. Another thought is everybody's kind of really likes the 1.73, but hasn't really touched it. Would a 1.73 for this year and if we really make it our mandate to look at those tax incentives for next year, or like, because that's part of the plan, I don't know, would that, because a 1.73 increase, 
across the board that doesn't hurt anybody. I don't know. It's just tossing out ideas. My, my answer to that would be 1.73 is the rate you want to look at for the ability to make that change because it is so low. Uh, Councillor Hodgins? Again, continuing on with the conversation, I, I'm watching the faces and the nodding and bobbing and assuming most people are in favor of looking for a way to uh, recognize our the businesses existing and potential. I, I'm wondering in the short term, and I know we have a very active business community that would like to get involved, if they would uh, find a way <coughs> very short term to maybe give us a bit of advice around this. I mean, after all, they are going to be the individuals directly impacted, and I would like to hear from our businesses you know, around the expectations. Uh, it could be that they would suggest that if we pick option in the middle, uh, option two, that that, that incentive is sufficient, or there, there may be some other suggestions. So. Just uh, throwing it out to see if, in fact, there is some appetite to hear from the business people. Uh, I think Councillor uh, Bream has uh, given some indication of, of what the Chamber has and, and businesses are saying out there. And certainly, uh, I haven't heard the message change. Uh, well, if, the, and if we're, going to the, if we're going to go to the community to ask for input, then you've already changed the time frame with which we're going to be making a decision. So we may as well take a look at an option, is, is how that would, in my view, roll out. Um, uh, so if, if we delay at all, um, then we do change the schedule in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, just to confirm it, I did hear the comments from Councilor Graham in terms of their concern. I'm, not, I'm looking for the solution. I don't believe that they can give us a solution. <laughs> as much as it would be nice. Councillor Hundleby. Uh, thank you. So the, the question that I had in my mind, you've answered. Uh, it was around the timing. So I certainly uh, understood where uh, uh, Councillor Hodgins was is thinking when I'm thinking, well, I wonder how that changes our time. I am still concerned that we would not replenish up to the level that we had been providing for our capital reserve and also our contingency. I'm actually like the idea of going forward with keeping those. Um, so I guess I'm feeling really quite conflicted here. Thank you. Council, we, uh, um, we need to have maybe a motion put on the floor so that we can start to uh, have some firm discussion. Councillor Morrison. Sorry, I'm not really necessary to put a motion on the floor, but just a quick question through the chair and the staff. And I know this was touched on the timelines. I think we need to be clear here. So what is the problem with, with, with delay? Uh, is there a cost involved? Is there a complication, a severe complication involved? And what resources, you, just resources. Just resources. So, no, there's a, yeah. a, you have to adopt your tax rate financial plan before the 15th of May. That's not flexible. So we're first week of April. So you would, it's just to capture a bit of the discussion again, uh, in terms of consulting the business community or ourselves, um, through our staff, investigating further options that could be, that could alleviate the cost of tax increases to, to businesses is possible. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to think, say is that it seems like we got a bit of an artificial premise that this is we just we'd love to all do this, but there's just not enough time, and I, I don't want to lose that before we vote uh, on an option. So I, I think just to be clear, Council, that we we have a set schedule right now of dates for meetings. That schedule for budget process is usually often changed when you make these decisions. You need to recognize that it may be changed and you may be asked to, to attend a meeting that isn't on your schedule. If you feel important that this is important enough to do that, um, then then by all means we can give that uh, that direction to Ms. Hurst. 
and um, go forward. And Ms. Hurst, you want to add something to that? So. Well, maybe I'll just complicate things even more. But so another scenario, the council may be able to get direction, and we can still stick to the schedule and still and give businesses um, a break. Is 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 there anybody on council? Council that's not comfortable with a 2.49. I mean, 2.49 is still a really good increase. But I'm also hearing that you want to keep the capital project reserve fund and the contingency at the previous level. So we could keep the tax increase at 2.49. We could use $110,000 of the 173 to keep our two amounts at previous levels. And we can say we don't need to collect $63,000 from our business class, and I can adjust the rates and the multiple. get you all three things that you're looking for until we can come up with a master plan and a strategy going forward. Thank you. So I want to hear from Councilor Mackay. Well, as a taxpayer and new to this, uh, again, thank you very much, Lori, for all the work you put into it. Uh, and what you just threw at me, I was sitting here looking at the 2.49 saying, okay, we've got $173,000. Why can't we take some of that and give it to the business? And then you turn around and give you that option, which uh, impressed me quite a bit that I would be willing to stay with the 2.49 and put the 110 in and say, okay, go to work and figure out how much it's gonna cost our businesses to be reduced keep them happy. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hundleby. Thank you. I would move scenario four as outlined by Ms. Hurst. Second. Third. <laughs> Further discussion. <laughs> Councillor Brame and then Councillor Morrison. Okay, with, with option four, or First. scenario four, so right now, if you look at the 2.49% scenario one, yeah. uh, major industry, just because it's the biggest number, is at 1,077. So would that drop, like? No, the scenario four, scenario four as I outlined, mm -hmm. actually won't transfer costs to the rest of your property classes. All those other numbers would stay the same. Yes. Everything's gonna stay the same except the business is going to go down. Just the business one. Yes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this um, spreadsheet, 2.49% uh, spreadsheet, and at the top of the page, I'm going to say I don't need $63,000 of the money I'm supposed to collect from class six, but all the other tax rates and multiples stay the same. So it's just going to change the tax rate and the multiple in the business class, and I'm going to collect less money from that property class because I don't need that $63,000 dollars because we have already balanced the budget. Okay. Awesome, Morris. Um, yeah, I'm also finding myself leaning towards option four. My only concern is that if I if we set this expectation that the messaging to the business community is that we've reduced your taxes and once you take that hundred and ten thousand dollars, is that right? Yeah, the 110,000 will be, we're going to increase our contingency back to 250,000. We're going to increase our, our um, contribution to our, our capital reserve fund back up to a million. And then we're not going to collect $63,000 of revenue from the business class. And you can see we normally collect $2.255 million. Right, so I guess where I was going is that I'm, I'm worried that this is more largely symbolic. It, it does achieve the sentiment of the council tonight, but but it doesn't do anything to solve problems of, of uh, it does a very minimal, very minimal amount to, to solve the problems. In fact, almost really a nominal, uh, you know, decrease to the point where it won't make much difference. Of course, every dollar saved is, is, is good for businesses, but, but I'm worried that if we get carried away with, with our messaging tonight, that there's somehow providing a benefit to, or a relief to, to business property taxpayers, that may not actually be the end result in, in, in the eyes of the business community. So 
that, that I think that's something that needs to be um, to be fully examined before we vote on this. So, Councilor Shinbin, did you lift your hand? I follow along with what Councilor Morrison is saying. When I look at the difference between 239 and 166, you take 60,000 off. I don't know that it's going to have a significant impact on the business. Um, and it, so uh, my preference would be is that, uh, like Councillor Morrison, if, if we uh, were able to work this through with numbers actually in front of us in terms of looking at, my preference is um, scenario two or scenario three with uh, an adjustment, uh, a slight adjustment for business uh, class to come back to us with those, that kind of a, a scenario and what does it look like. Uh, and then we could weigh that against um, this uh, scenario four, which has just come up, which uh, sort of gives you a little bit of candy in every corner, but really does it, does it touch on um, the fact that we are in this unique situation where we could go down to a 1.73. And so um, I, I have difficulty in making the decision on, on scenario four without really knowing the impact. So we do have Councillor Hodgins. Well, with the uh, scenario four, we are newly recognizing existing business, uh, albeit not a lot of money, but it, it, it's, it's a significant amount of money. And it would give us then that opportunity going forward to have a serious conversation around what rates should our existing and future businesses be taxed at. And to do that in a more researched and evidence-based approach as opposed to it just seems like we're, we're, we're hurrying up to make a decision uh, that uh, you know, will have a significant impact long term. I'm not afraid to make those tough decisions, but I would want to spend more time deliberating that, those types of decisions. That's my point. But if you suggest that the calendar, and I, I'll come every night of the week if we have to, to, to meet and talk about what is best for the community. But, uh, want to do that as opposed to rush into something. So, I mean, it's all positive conversation. I think we're all in the same place in terms of wanting to do what's right and responsible for our, our residents and businesses, but it's just what does that mean? Especially, you know, we're, we're in a very good place this year, and if we make a change and it puts us in a position next year where we're talking a, a lot different scenario in terms of potential tax increase that we would look back and say, oh, did we really take the time to deliberate and make the right decisions? Thank, Thank you. you. Council, I'm, just before I call the question, I want to say that what a wonderful situation to be in to be able to have all of this conversation. And thank you, staff, for, for getting us there and, and giving us all of these wonderful options. Um, in response to uh, Councillor Hodgins, um, I agree, we don't want to rush into this. If we made a change in the business rate this year and that allowed us to have even three more businesses, what would that do to our bottom line next year when they're at a multiple of higher amount than, than uh, the others? So, Again, uh, just through experience having sat at the table and knowing that this has come up every year and yet we've never been able to feel comfortable because of the change that it would impact on residents. Um, that's why I'm, I'm pushing so hard this year. Um, so I'm going to call the question. Uh, I'm going to say that I, I'm not going to support the recommendation as it's going forward. Uh, and it's for that reason that I'd really still like to look at those other scenarios. So. Uh, you would like the question? I, uh, I'm going to call the question now. Yeah, can you, can you read it again? The motion. motion. Okay, the motion was uh, scenario four, which is basically giving us the 2.49 uh, amount. 
uh, $100,000 going back into, sir? $110,000. Thank you. Okay. It's for the contingency fund. It's about that 110. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Those opposed? Councilor Green. Oh. <laughs> opposed. Okay. Motion is defeated. That's. Thanks, Lori. Um, uh, is there another motion that you would like to put forward? Okay, I might need some working on this. I'm not sure still which way to go, but I can't not go forward without looking at it. So I would like to look at uh, different multiples for the business class and how that would affect the residential class and, and the other classes. So I would like to have that discussion and see those numbers, however you want to phrase that. I have no well, I think it's a re request a report from staff um, looking at uh, a change in the business uh, multiple, uh, such a, and and um, perhaps looking at um, a couple of rate differences to show us what the impact would be on the other yeah. um, um, cl classes. Yeah. yeah. Is there a seconder to your motion? Councillor Shinfai. Further discussion? Sorry. Councillor Morrison. A key factor, I think, would be, uh, certainly we've set an expectation that the property tax increases for residents will be uh, very likely 2.49% or possibly less. So, so I think that needs to be in the motion there. I don't want to have a situation where we come back where well, if residents were to now pay four percent, we could do this for business community. I do not want, I do not want that to be part of this. I think the motion is too vague in that it doesn't perhaps open the door for that. I, I, so I, I'd like that actually have a friendly amendment just to say um, contingent upon uh, all scenarios being four, two point four nine percent or less. Or less. Yeah. So, so the three tax amounts here. We're back to the three options again. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a full circle. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not clear on the motion whether in fact the reserve funds and the contingencies are back up to what they, um, up to that 110,000 or whether that's taking that out and we wouldn't be dealing with that at all. Based on the motion, they may vary because of what we're doing. So because with each um, option, we have various variables. Now what we're, our variable is, is the business rate, and then the other options may fall in or not in different amounts. Thank you. But I, I guess I won't be supporting it because I'm very concerned about the spin-offs of where it all goes right away. And I just think that the time crunch is such that I don't think we should entertain it without looking at the whole thing and we're staff are not prepared to do that. To look at the whole business incentive and whatever. I, don't know, I just I would rather see the whole thing we want to see that. Councillor Hodgson? I would also want to see us going forward. I believe we're in a position, in this positive position this evening. Let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a positive discussion. Uh, because of our history of being physically responsible in terms of the contingencies and the monies that we know we need annually to replace the equipment, etc. And for us now to have that opportunity to make sure that we continue to allocate the, annu annually the funds into those uh, Accounts and this this motion that we are now discussing does not have that option. 
we're going to, uh, again, I'm thinking longer term, what does that mean for us? And it, it may be a slippery slope. So I'm not able to support the motion as it is currently, unless there's a way to tweak the motion to bring us back to ensuring that those uh, contingency funds are replenished according to what's been working for us for the last few years. Councilor, this is a motion for this budget. So those options, those contingency funds, we do have policies to go forward each year. Um, so, um, and, and to explore these options does not necessarily mean we, we accept them at the end. We have these options to come back to. Maybe the solution, or may, maybe the ultimate decision. Councillor Breen? Yeah, it wasn't my intent that any of these options that come forward are necessarily the, the only three or two that we have. We will always have the three options, four options presented to us tonight. And if you remember, scenario two at 2.21% still maintained those contributions. And what we said in the motion is that our, they wouldn't go higher than 2.49. So that actually could still very well include that. It's just how you shuffle, how you shuffle. It could, instead of being 2.21, it could be 2.49 with it for, you know, just the way you shuffle. But that's how, that, I am by no means the whiz, so that's what uh, staff are for. But it doesn't take these away. I just feel in good conscience we have to look at it all, and then however it comes out, at least we've made the honest try to look at the multiples for business class, which is something we have heard year after year after year for business to at least look at it. And we haven't looked at it, even in these scenarios. It's just straight across the board. And that's my only concern, is we at least have to look at them, because we have the opportunity. Further discussion, if Councillor McConnell. Yeah, the question then is, uh, I understand, I think I understand the motion. Um, are we going to put a percentage on that? Of what we should be requesting that the staff look at for the business reduction, or are we just going to leave it up to them to figure it out? We've, we've asked them to provide us with a scenario, a couple of scenarios of difference, uh, different amounts. Uh, if you'd like to specify, I don't know whether staff can be of help um, with this at this time. Unfortunately, Ms. Hurst had to leave. Um, and uh, so um, I think that um, <coughs> if we leave the motion as stands and uh, unless there is somebody at staff table that wishes to answer this question. If we leave the motion as stands and if Ms. Hurst wants more clarity to it, then we can, we can always uh, have that uh, come forward to us. Councillor Morrison? I, I wonder also, uh, I don't want to weigh down the, the, the motion too much, but I wonder if we could put a stipulation in there that does uh, protect the contingency fund as outlined in the options, uh, options one and two, was it? Or I think you're changing option two, you know. at that point. Okay, so I just heard some, some concern that, that, that the possibility, possible result would be that they come back, uh, the staff come back to the council with recommendations that, that do it, um, reduce the pressure on business uh, property taxpayers, but at the same time may result in us losing our contingency fund protection. And that's a concern to me, and I share that concern. So, I, I, If I can yeah. clarify, I think it's not recommendations, it's options. Options. And okay. so we still have these options in front of us. So if you're not comfortable with what comes back, we can, we can do that. And we also ask staff to look within the scenarios we've got and how do the contingency funds fit in. I don't know whether that... That has to be clear in the minutes, I think. Gives you that more clarity. about the CEO. Yeah. Okay. Staff? Um, we had a motion first brought by uh, Councillor Brain and seconded by Councillor Shinbine uh, about uh, bringing the uh, different options. And then we had a proposed revision of, or an amendment to that motion brought by Councillor Morris, and it wasn't seconded. It was friendly. What, what is the second part? The second part was to add a clause that the property tax increases for the others to be 2.49% or less. That was not uh, OK. 
Okay, so we need a seconder for your. Who was not just a friend? It. it, it I'll second. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now, in terms of process, is that can that be included in the motion, or do we need to vote on that separately? We vote on that one first, and then the main motion as amended. Okay. Councillor, are you ready for me to call the question? We'll call the question on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment? None opposed. All those in favor of the motion as amended? Excuse me, point of order. Uh, so the last point that Councillor Morrison made regarding contingency and so on, where did that go? That was not in, in it's not in the motion. Thank you. Or, but however, point of order, it could be made as an amendment at the stage. Well, I think we, we had the discussion that it changes the flavor and it's still within all of our scenarios. So I'm going to call the question on the origin, on the main motion as amended. All those in favor? Those opposed? Councillor had to be opposed. Thank you, Council. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break, uh, but I wanted to say again, thank you to staff, and uh, it's, it's great to be able to have an hour long discussion on how we reduce your taxes and, and how we can benefit everybody. So, thanks. Five minutes. We now move on to the delegation, and Katrina Andres is here to uh, give us a presentation on uh, uh, the uh, Dogwood Initiative um, and the process to update the regional growth strategy. Katrina, please come forward. Welcome to the spot. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me. Um, I, my name is Katrina Andres and I'm a second year law student at the University of Victoria and uh, I'm currently in the environmental law clinic program. And so the reason for the presentation tonight is to introduce the recommendations of the sustainability white paper um, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, it's to point counsel in the direction of the recommendations in five policy areas for the Regional Sustainability Strategy, or the RSS, and to really introduce this into the public discussion. So the white paper is a submission by the Environmental Law Clinic on behalf of Dogwood Initiative. And it's essentially a compilation of best practices to implement in the regional bylaw and policy in order to strengthen the current regional growth strategy. It was written by five law students and professor and lawyer Deborah Curran, who's been involved with uh, regional growth strategy issues uh, since the original RGS was developed. And the white paper built on the great foundation that the current RGS sets, and it's, re it's grouped the recommendations into five main policy areas. So these are uh, to reform governance in the region to apply a carbon evaluation framework, to create compact, complete communities, integrate green infrastructure through expanded and updated green blue spaces and biodiversity corridor planning, supporting the sustainable regional economy and reinforcing the regional food system. So to go into these policies in a little bit more detail, the first is again to reform governance in the region to apply a carbon evaluation framework to all decisions made at the CRD. So this means that the new RSS will be effective with a carbon evaluation framework embedded into all decision making within the CRD. And this is fundamental to achieving the CRD's greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals and climate change commitments. The second policy is to create compact, complete communities in planned locations where a range of affordable housing and transportation options are available. So this means that the new RSS will be effective by offering an even stronger commitment to promoting complete communities. Enhanced policies and bylaws that reinforce urban containment boundaries will optimize the use of uses of existing amenities and infrastructure and efficiently allocate local government resources and protect the integrity of the rural and agricultural land in the region. The third policy is to integrate green infrastructure throughout all communities in the region through expanded and updated blue-green spaces and biodiversity corridor planning, 
And this includes extending the green blue spaces strategy to the Juan de Fuca landscape and using integrated rainwater and stormwater management techniques. So this means that a foundational principle of the new RSS must be the protection of our region's ecological health and biodiversity. More rigorous application of the uh, blue-green strategy will reduce fragmentation and pollution of critical habitat. The fourth policy is to support the sustainable regional economy through the efficient use of natural resources uh, within green industry, building on the strong protection of the rural working landscape and the Victoria Economic Development Strategy. So this means that the new RSS must strengthen local government's ability to protect the rural working landscape from urban development and must regionalize all decisions and practices related to water and waste management. And the fifth policy is to reinforce the regional food system by continuing to protect all agricultural land and creating an integrated food system strategy for food security and a vibrant agricultural industry in the region. So this means that the new RSS must emphasize the importance of food security and local agricultural production through the continued protection of agricultural land and the development of a regional food system strategy. So in conclusion, this report reaffirms that the regional growth strategy as it is has proven to be a highly effective tool in managing growth, and it suggests that this mandatory review uh, offers a great opportunity to strengthen in some key areas. So I would encourage council and uh, mayor to read the report and there's uh, links on the three-page handout as well. And uh, I've been presenting at municipal council meetings for the past couple months as well. And uh, I should also mention that council will be hearing from uh, supportive groups in the region in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Trin Katrina. And I'm going to open it up to questions from council, but I also want to know if you have done or are planning to do a presentation to the CRD Planning and uh, Transportation I, Committee. I have done, uh, I, in February, I, I presented at the Great. Planning Protective Services Committee. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Council, any questions of Katrina? You did a good job. I do want to let you know that um, as Chair of the Environment Committee at CRD, we, uh, in fact, uh, came up against this whole notion at our last meeting um, when we were looking at the kitchen scraps program and the benefit of doing one one direction and, and what are the carbon offsets versus going another direction and the cost. Uh, so we have made the recommendation to staff to include that kind of comparison in terms of dollar value because one, one is, is real dollars economics and the other is, is long-term savings and, and dollar savings. So um, I'm pleased to say that, that uh, uh, quite through osmosis, we, we ended up uh, starting to put these kinds of values in. So Great. Thank, thank you. you very much. I just wonder if it might be worthwhile to also refer this, if the council refer this to our environmental advisory committee for their information. Um, in terms of uh, uh, no, so presentation? Not, yeah, no, just the, the document uh, and the, uh, access to the report. Certainly. Um, not asking for any specific direction or, or advice, but just for their information. Okay, so you're making a motion to refer. Is there a second uh, discussion? None, all those in favor? Good. We'll now move on down the chain. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And you're welcome to come to the Environmental Advisory Committee. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next on the agenda we have Staff Reports Strategic Priorities Report. Uh, who on staff is going to address this? Is, okay. um, my report is on page 24. Um, it does set up in the middle of the page there uh, five, uh, just a summary of some changes that were made to this strategic plan as requested by council when I first looked at it uh, a month ago. Um, I can just point out as well, on page 27 is the executive summary that was requested along with the uh, strategic priorities chart. Um, I think it reads very well. There's a couple of uh, typos in uh, page numbers that need to still get uh, corrected and I'll make sure 
sure that that's done. But I also wanted to point out in the recommendations that it does provide for regular and quarterly and annual updating and the scheduling of regular strategic sessions to discuss uh, issues and updating the plan. I, I understand there were some comments or concerns from various uh, committees that received a copy and thought that they weren't uh, given sufficient time to make comments and I tried to reassure them that this is a living document as we were told and that we would be reviewing it during the three-year term of council and there's always opportunity for it for during that. Council, there is a recommendation before you. Are there questions for staff? Councilor um, Hanabi. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, my question, it's not really a question, it's a comment. And I would like to uh, advise uh, Council that the Environmental uh, Advisory Committee uh, reviewed this and, and made, a, I think, a very pertinent comment. And that was around including the um, ideas of sustainable community, uh, economy, uh, e e for, the, for the economy, the social, environmental, um, infrastructure and governance. And I'm just quoting that right out of the setting priorities document. So it was actually included in the text, but in the summary document, I guess, and also in the chart, it didn't actually show that we were looking at sustainability broadly. And we have, that's what we do. We've been doing it for the last however many years, um, including the, all the sustainability pieces in, including signing on to the Climate Action Charter, all of those things that we have been doing, just as a matter of course and a matter of our work. Uh, but it doesn't actually reflect it in the chart. And I think that that was a good point for someone who is not understanding the way that we have been working to see that it's actually there even though there is one small point that said under corporate climate action plans. Uh, so it was sort of referred to sort of in a way, but the whole backdrop, the whole background of how we are trying to work in a sustainable fashion doesn't actually reflect in that. And, and I certainly would like to see that it's there for everyone to, see, to know, not just us. Are there discussion? Um, I know that a um, uh, comment around sustainability is very important and, and as such it is one of our overarching principles that we use and, and I'm feeling that then having it there as an overarching principle um, then puts us through that lens whether you incorporate it right onto the piece of paper or not um, or comment. Councilor Morrison. Just also, just to back up uh, Councillor Andelby's comments as the, the other uh, member, the liaison member for Council on the Environmental Advisory Committee, uh, I think the group uh, consensus was that this also was the, the sustainability factor and the fact that we are a green community and striving to be a greener community uh, really um, pay tribute to the fact that we're also trying to, uh, we call it Scrum of Legacies now, it's called Future shaping our future, and a big part of that was the image that Esquimalt portrays externally. And I think the sentiment of the Environmental Advisory Committee was this is something to be very proud of as a community, and that will help us look, be seen in a more positive light from the region, from the province, from, from other levels of government, um, and, and development community and whatnot, and, and just attracting residents to want to come and live here and help us grow. So, like Councillor Hundley, I think it is important to have that language in there because it does back up a lot of the other, most of the other, uh, in some way or shape or form, it does back up many of our other priorities, our top priorities. So, uh, so would you like to make the motion, uh, the recommendation uh, inclusive of the, uh, uh, just the discussion that the Environmental Advisory Committee brought forward? Um, sure, I'm not exactly sure of what the wording is would be other than what they provided us. Yeah, and I'm not exactly sure where I would position that. They suggested uh, in the, um, it, what did they ask? That if they suggested in the, in the actual strategic priorities report and the chart. Um, I'm not sure if, well, perhaps Councilor Hundley can help, but I don't know how this could fit into the chart. Councilor Hundley? I believe it's already in the report. 
But what I would suggest is under uh, the, the heading council priorities and in the brackets council CAO and do another line and then um, uh, so we could we could wordsmith a little bit but uh, we could refer to um, uh, I'm not sure whether we want to use the word culture of sustainability including economic, environmental, social, cultural or use the language that you provided which I think is actually also useful is overarching principle uh, council priorities Would you like to send it to staff yes, to incorporate <laughs> and bring back to us? Yes, thank you. So I just I, these minutes have not been approved by the by the environmental advisory committee. I do recall, and probably Councilor Huntley uh, will recall that we we did actually wordsmith it a little better than this. I know it was several attempts, but we, we were concerned that it had culture in there twice in two different kinds of meetings. Meetings, and we'll see. It says. Squamish culture is sustainable, including economic, environmental, social, cultural. I know we tried to fix that. So I think when the when the committee does see those draft minutes, they'll probably correct that. And I don't want that to be our final language in a very important to document. So, so what we're doing is with uh, uh, the motion will be to recommend to, that we send this to staff to incorporate in the document uh, um, and bring it back to us. For uh, approval, with, with this sustainability messaging. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that you're okay to make that motion? Uh, there is a motion on the floor, so no. No. Would no. you make? No, we're clarifying them, uh, yes. a wording of a motion because we were starting to make a motion and it was going around in a circle. So, all right. So then, I would move that we refer to staff. Uh, to incorporate, refer to staff to incorporate the language of uh, the sustainability culture that we use and put that into our council priorities in the chart. Second. Further discussion? Being none, all those in favor? <coughs> Any opposed? Councilor Shin is opposed. Esquimalt Buccaneer Day Committee appointments. Council, this did come before us before, and what we did do is my understanding is this is just clarification. We need to ratify these appointments. So, move so staff move. recommendation. Thank you. Second. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Motion is carried. Thank you.
persons connected to the project, and uh, that will not have a budget impact. And the other extent of the project will be probably no more than a one or two hour interview with the department heads. Move the recommendation. Second. Thank you. I have Councillor Hennelby, you have a question. Um, it isn't a question. I wanted to support the project. I believe that it's important for Esquimo to be a resilient community in terms of a disaster. So I would like us to move forward on that. I'm also very supportive of the Capstone Project uh, as, a, as an entity. I'm somewhat familiar with it. And I know that it's of a, a tremendous value to the students. And I think it's of tremendous value to us. So I'm Thank you. And so just to clarify, no financial impact. That's Thank, correct. Thanks, Chief. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? None opposed. Motion is carried. Payment in lieu of taxes. Um, Mary. Uh, uh, Councillor Morrison, uh, you have a, a potential conflict of interest. Would you like to state what it is? Sure. Um, it's just a perceived conflict of interest in that BC assessment is my employer and we are referenced extensively in this report. So I'll remove myself from the discussion. Don't stray too far. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have nothing to add to the report, but I can take a question. Okay. Thanks very much. Questions, Council? Councillor Hennelby. Thank you. Um, so through you to um, Ms. Turner, I, I confess that I had difficulty understanding the report. So if, if I could just ask you the question uh, that I had, and that is, so we're looking at two budget years, both 2010 and 2011, is that correct? Correct. And so for 2010, we are still awaiting a decision by the appeal board. Is that yes, uh, the, the appeal has been sent in and a letter was uh, sent to the township that the 2010 uh, appeal will be reviewed this year. Thank you. And then the 2011 appeal was just submitted um, in March. And I have acknowledgement from the chair that they did receive that, our, our appeal for 2011. Thank you. So I expect that the review will actually happen next year if, if it kind of follows the pattern. Thank you. In two years. <laughs> in, two, in two years. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hannity. Councillor Brain. So just to reconfirm what I believe I heard from Ms. Hurst earlier, we budget on the, what is it, the PWGSC values hoping that we'll get BC assessment, but we budget, what is it, budget low or budget? We budget low. conservatively. Yeah, budget yes. conservatively. So, yes. you know, if we get the BC assessment, that's great. If we don't, we're still within our budget. Exactly, what we do is, yes. Just reconfirming what I heard. Right. Okay. Move the recommendation. Thank you, and second. Thank you, I just want to add a statement that this is, uh, this is to me a disturbing trend that we have now had two years in a row, albeit that we do a great job in budgeting conservatively. And I think that as uh, at FCM, uh, PILT is uh, one of their priority items uh, and unfortunately I have had to drop out of PILT, uh, uh, FCM but I think it would be uh, important for us as a community to notify um, the FCM PILT committee uh, of, of this uh, trend and uh, uh, see if there is any assistance or uh, what it, what's going on in the rest of the country with regards to their PILT. Um, it, only, only by the, the the well-documented uh, and uh, phone calls and uh, conservativeness of our staff, do we uh, really um, have this occur with minimal impact? However, if, uh, if we don't get on top of this, it, it, as I say, it is a disturbing trend. So I would like to have a motion to receive this and uh, to send the letter to FCM uh, with uh, the uh, uh, information that uh, this is occurring in our community and 
uh, get an update from their subcommittee as to what they're doing about the bill. No move. Seconder? Second. We, we actually, we have a motion to receive, so maybe yeah. we need to do that first. Uh, so I'm calling the question on the motion to receive. Okay. All those in favor? Good. Uh, none opposed. Uh, and now if, if we could have that second motion. And a seconder for that? Second. Thank you. And you have a question, Councillor Shinbai. Uh, actually, maybe it's more of a comment. I'm just uh, uh, on the pill. I was just reading some information yesterday uh, about a town called Beaker. And they have a large military base in their municipality. They just settled and they, and they got a, a, a fair bit of, of money back. So I just was going to suggest to staff that they might want to look at uh, what the town of Meeker did in Ontario to accomplish getting that extra money out of it. And, and it was a, it was in, it was on the, the web on a, on a news article that I like to read, and it was significant the the, the agreement that they made uh, to get that, and they had a long start, a long. Uh, term disagreement to a four or five years of been trying. Anyways, I just was going to suggest that that might be a community to maybe look at. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hunnaby. Thank you. I wondered if uh, Councillor Shinbine could um, spell the name of the town for me so I could look at it. M-E-A-F-O-R-D. Thank you. Ontario. Okay, and we have a motion. All those in favor? None opposed, motion's carried, and we need to get Councillor Morrison back in the room. We now move on to Strategic Community Investment Funds Agreement. Uh, this is Ms. Turner. Uh, I have nothing to add, but I take questions. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, there uh, it, it speaks in, within this document that uh, we have to ensure uh, that we've submitted this before March 23rd. Has there been a change to that date? I have spoken to the ministry to indicate that this was going to the April today's uh, council meeting, and once it would be um, approved for signature, we would send it off. And that seemed to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, be fine because we have received our first installment payment. Um, as per the agreement. Great, thanks. Council, you have a recommendation in front of you? Please so staff we'll recommendation. Thank you. And we've got two names there. Um, is there discussion? Seeing yeah. none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None, the motion is carried. We move on to reports from the committees. Uh, Council, I... Uh, I'd like to leave out item two, uh, but perhaps you could consider um, receiving item one, three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, yes, I don't believe there are any at this time. Councillor Hundleby, there were, uh, uh, I was asked to defer them and I'm happy to do that. I'll, I'll write a, a written report. And, and it was really also to get the information on the, the piece of paper that you were referring to as well, if we can have that in front of us. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so everything but two? Everybody okay with that? No? Well, there are two memorandums, do they not usually? Do we have to speak to those specifically? Se separate out two, three, and five then. I need, I need a motion to receive. Uh, one, four, six, and seven. So moved. Seconded. Thank you. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor. Motion carries. All right, item two, um, and I know that Councillor Hunnaby would like to uh, uh, speak to uh, an item within the first minutes in that zero ways. <coughs> Thank you. So if I would uh, begin by uh, moving adoption of the minutes from the Environmental Advisory Committee. Do you adoption receipt? Uh, move receipt. Thank you. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion? Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, just bring to your attention, Council's attention, the idea of the zero waste events. And it's something that was uh, started last year 
with um, the uh, tree celebration, and I think they're also trying to do it for Buccaneer Days, but trying to deal with the uh, products from the food that required uh, dealing with. So whether you recycle it or throw it in the garbage or whatever. And the idea was to plan for a zero waste event. And I think there was a lot of learning that was done in those times. And it was decided to bring it forward this year as a major work plan because we would like to provide guidelines and eventually a policy. And so I, I took this idea uh, at the with the approval of the Environmental Advisory Committee to the Intermunicipal Committee on Climate Action Forum with the CRD, and they were all very keen on this as well. And I thought it was very good to show that Esquimalt is leading in, in, in this way. But it's not a big thing in terms of reducing our greenhouse gases, but it's a huge thing in terms of education and people working individually on greening our community and, and looking after our environment. The spin-off for me is that it will also reduce all the debris that's left over after an event. If we have a conscious working on recycling and putting things tight. So I see this as a huge thing. The one thing that was brought up is that for the Centennial Committee, we will have a closed system, and so there's quite a lot of control over that, and I think that it will really highlight how well we can do it. So I'm all geared up for doing that. I said I would help, but then I realized I'm supposed to be dressed up, so I might not be able to help in quite the same way. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councilor Hendelby. Any discussion, questions? Councilor Chimbay? When I, uh, thank you, Your Worship. When I looked over this uh, in the minutes, uh, I guess I'm, uh, I'm kind of in favor of it. But the, the question that came to me is for event planners and, and people that are doing nonprofit work and all this, I haven't seen anywhere in here where it, it says whether it'll cost any more money to go that way or to do the zero event planning, but they can't get all the volunteers to direct people that the garbage pail is over here or recycling is there. Like, I, I don't see any details uh, about how this plan is. It, it, it's just all uh, philosophy, if you will. Uh, I haven't seen anything in there. And again, too, is that going to discourage nonprofit groups? Maybe going is they might agree with it, but we can't afford the additional expense of doing that to put this particular event on. Uh, because my experience has been anything that evolves around any of this type of activity ultimately costs more money. And I mean, it's, it's proven. So my concern is, although it might be a wonderful uh, initiative to support and, and, and to direct all our, our um, groups that way, before I would go yes or no, I would like to have some idea that somebody's done a costing note on this that, is it going to increase? Do we have to raise fees? Do we, you know, because what happens if they can't get the volunteers to deal with that issue? I tell you right now, I probably will not stand in front of the garbage pail and correct people to do stuff. So, and I'm probably not alone. So, those are sort of the questions I have. And, and uh, uh, before we start dictating to uh, groups that they have to do this, I would like to see some financial information here, whether it increases the cost to them. Every little penny of your fundraiser makes a difference. I'm going to get, get Councilor Hundleby to respond to that, and, uh, and uh, then if there's further to add, I can certainly add it. Thank you. Uh, all relevant comments, and those were also brought up at the committee, and that was one reason why I wanted to take it to the Intermunicipal Forum. Uh, the decision was that we should try to do this. There's guidelines that have been started, so the second version is on its way. And in that, there was going to be a, uh, suggestions on who could provide certain items so that it wouldn't be, so if you were a nonprofit and you're coming forward and you want to do something, in this guideline, it would suggest 
here's things that you could do if you have choices, here's what you might choose, and where you might be able to get some of that, some of those goods that are being used. Yes, there may, there may be a charge, and th what we didn't want to see was to have people say, well, we don't want to deal with this formal because they expect all this. What we were hoping was that all CR, all events in the Capital Regional District would eventually go this route. It is um, a, a stepwise kind of an effort. It's not something that it's going to be all or nothing right at the beginning. We couldn't mandate that. But it really is going to start out as guidelines, and then we would put it into policy once we were aware that it was very doable. Taking into consideration all of the things that you've raised, Councillor Shea. And um, Esquimalt has already piloted a project, and that was our opening uh, grand kickoff for our centennial. And we've learned a lot from that event. And so um, to, to add that information as, go, as we go forward. The, the, the idea is um, to headed towards zero waste. Certainly that's a mandate of CRD as well. And it, it's, it's around those three R's, which is, you know, recycle, reuse, and whatever the third one is, I never remember. Reduce. 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 Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Okay, thanks. So we have the motion to receive. Did I call the question yet? No. All those in favor. And thank you for the report. Any opposed? One opposed, Councillor Shinwright. We have, uh, move on to uh, item three, memorandum from the Environmental Advisory Committee. This is, uh, again, uh, we need to receive this report. Do we receive? Second. Uh, any further discussion, Councillor Brain? Um, this is one of our, uh, well, one of our very active committees, and I think they've done uh, a lot of work in this past year, and I just wanted to make sure we took that time to acknowledge it. Absolutely, and their reports are always very good as well. Uh, I will call the question. All those in favor? And those opposed? None. Motion is carried, and uh, we'd like to. Uh, send back via the councillors uh, our thanks uh, for uh, the information and the reports. Minutes from the, uh, where are we at? Uh, item five, memorandum from the Heritage Advisory Committee. Move to Who seconded? Thank you. Uh, are there, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all oh, those in favor? Well, it just, they do have a recommendation on the bottom. Is that for us or them? <coughs> That's for them. Well, it says we hope that council will encourage them to work with the Heritage Advisory Committee. It, it seems to me that it's not a recommendation, it's a, it's a statement. So, all those in favor? Those opposed? None. Motion is carried. Uh, under communication, we have the letter from Malcolm Barker, C-SPAN uh, Council. Uh, we need a motion to receive that and or if you would like some discussion on it. Move receive. Second. Thank you. I would uh, just like to comment that this is uh, the kind of support that I like to see out there in our community uh, where the business is willing to step up and say, you know, we all need some help here. and. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's always interesting when a business is willing to stand up and make a strong statement like that. So I, I, I'm very thankful to them for that. Councillor Shinbai. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I put this out to council. Would it be appropriate that we maybe uh, send a, a letter to C-SPAN uh, thanking them for taking this initiative and, and that, uh, letting them know that they have the support, uh, C-SPAN has the support of the township as well. Uh, it, if that requires a motion, I would quite willing to put that forward. I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe that we actually directed that we would send a letter to them asking for their support in writing a letter. So this is their response to us. Oh. So we can go back and forth again, but <laughs> I think in passing, if, if we'll certainly convey our thanks for the, the letter. Would you find that acceptable? Yes, no, 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 no. Okay, thank you. And seconder, you're yep. okay with that? Yep. 
Okay. We now move on to public question and comment period. Are there any members of the public that wish to? Oh, yes. Right. Thank you. I'm calling the question. All those in favor to receive. Any opposed? Uh, motion's carried. Thank you very much, Councilor Hodge. Any members of the public that wish to speak? Any members of the public that wish to speak? Any members of the public that wish to speak? Hearing none, I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. And I, I need a motion to uh, return to uh, in camera. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, audience. And uh, I don't want to rush you, but uh, I do want to rush you. <laughs>